participated in the Pfizer trials, when in fact what she had was a seizure, and she's now wheel-bound, wheelchair-bound, nasogastric tube. One of a thousand subjects. This is a 13-year-old girl right, that was part of the study, and they wrote it down as what? Gastric distress. That's, that's literally what it says in terms of the adverse effect. Gastric distress, like what? what is gastric distress? Stomach ache. That's it. But what, how do they account for all the other injuries? They don't. They don't. They take her off of the study. They, they how take is that her possible? That, that, and that's totally unethical. It is. Right? It is so it who's is, signing off on that? How, do they, how are they allowed to do that? So the way the rules work in regulatory affairs, so this is law, right? This is regulatory affairs law and common practice at the FDA and globally. There's all kinds of treaties and things that regulate how these things are supposed to be done. The rule is, it used to be that a pharmaceutical company could kind of offload all the liability for bad stuff that might happen in a clinical trial and be mismanaged, etc., onto the performer, the subcontractor. It used to be that pharma actually did the trials themselves. And then they found it was cheaper, more efficient, and they could push off their liability if they engaged companies like I've been working for for decades, contract research organizations, clinical contract research organizations. And so that was done for a while. And if anything bad went bad in the trial, then the pharma could say, oh, it was not us. It was those guys. Now, in the last few years, the FDA got wise to that, and they made policy that the responsibility vests with the sponsor. That's fancy regulatory speak for it's pharma owns it, okay? So you ask the question, whose responsibility is it to ensure that the data isn't contaminated and manipulated? The answer is Pfizer. Wow. So they're responsible for the data. They're allowed to say that this was just some sort of a gastric distress. And the job of the FDA always is to ferret out monkey business, which happens all the time whether intentional or unintentional. And there's all kinds of ways you can craft clinical trials and craft clinical trial study reports, final study reports, to hide the bad stuff and highlight the good stuff. So in this clinical trial that this young lady was involved in, um, how many children were involved in the study? It's 2,000 approximately, but they're split into placebo and experimental groups, and so she was in the treatment group. Now, one of the things that people have said in response to the vaccine injuries is that it's approximately one in a thousand that are getting these significant injuries like myocarditis and so you think it's there's more? a there's a well um it's important when we talk about these things to make a distinction between an event that is um, clinically significant and might result in hospitalization versus something that might be undetected unless you did a laboratory test or, you know, maybe, like for instance, myself, when I started to experience those things that I experienced after Moderna, I was confused. It was not listed as among the side effects. I thought I just suddenly developed um, rampant hypertension um, until the data started coming out, and I, you know, fortunately I had a, an astute cardiologist that got me under control, and got me under medical management. Um, and then I looked into it, oh, this is one of the known side effects. And then time went by and it became more and more clear. So the point is that what gets reported in a study um, is often biased by how the study is structured. Because one lists when you, when you write the study protocol, list expected adverse events and so people if those things happen oftentimes they get checked but I guarantee one of the expected adverse events was not seizure and paralysis okay now what they did one of the things there's all kinds of tricks you can play with the data if, you, if you're so inclined um, and that's why it's so important People like me that do clinical research for a living, we get drummed into our head bioethics on a, on a regular basis. It's obli obligatory training, and we have to be retrained all the time. So that, because there's a long history of physicians doing bad stuff, 
like monkey business. You know, the most notable, of course, and common knowledge is the Tuskegee experience. But so it happens. Um, there's all kinds of financial incentives to make bad stuff go away and highlight good stuff. It makes the sponsor happy. Um, and then you get another contract. These are not little contracts. You know, a, a, a modest clinical trial is $20 million. A big one is $100 million or more. Okay, so these are big money deals. You want to keep that money flowing, and you want to keep your sponsor happy. So that's what's come out with the whistleblower with Pfizer, is that the contractor, I think it's here in Texas, that ran a bunch of those clinical trials, um, appears to have manipulated data in a variety of ways. Um, and, and this is done at the level of, of checking the data and reconciling the data and deciding which things go into the database and which things don't go into the database and whether or not well, if somebody had an adverse event after shot one and then they're dropped because they won't take shot two, um, you know, do we drop them out of this overall study analysis? That's why there's, there's, we have all this specific language that we use in our business, the intent to treat cohort, the per protocol cohort. These are separate analyses. They describe these differences in how, because it's known that you can manipulate the data in these different ways. And it's clear now, and basically this was the subject, by the way, just to bring it back around to our first time. This is the subject of that um, presentation that the Canadians put out, that I put in that Twitter post, was all the different ways that the Pfizer data was manipulated. The fact that that is grounds for being removed from Twitter is so astonishing. I, I, it's, it's just... It blows my mind that that's the number one platform for distributing information. You know, like that. Because it is. I mean, it's, it's essentially the number one. That would and Facebook. I don't know which one's bigger. But for distributing information. So, um, what's recently taking place? So, so remember, looping back, I talked about the interconnectedness of the board level between Pfizer and Thomson Reuters. Yes. Okay. Thomson Reuters has become the fact checker of choice for determining what's fact checker, right? right? And we know we so we can go into the, the Facebook philosophy from that story. But Thompson Reuters is tied to Pfizer. Um, they have common corporate ownership and they are the fact checker of Twitter now. Integrated. Okay? So it's, it's Thomson Reuters is making the decision, um, which has connections to Pfizer, about what information will be allowed to be discussed on Twitter. That is crazy. It's so crazy to even hear. I, I, and I don't know how we ever pull out of this place. I mean, I think we're at a 45 degree downward angle heading into the mountain. I really do. It's, it's so strange to me that no one's up in arms about this other than a few people that have been censored, a few people that have these uh, uh, opposing viewpoints that are you know, deemed to be something you can't discuss. Well, it's, it's, Joe, it's even deeper than that. Okay. Then there's the hunting of physicians. So I myself, you know, Peter McCullough is the textbook example of hunting physicians, right? The guy is 150,000 150, in debt, right?
gave that talk, that hospital and the hospitals associated with them are actively involved and have kicked out Kirk Milhelm because he's giving early treatment to the horse broke. Okay. Now who's Kirk Milhelm? You know, why is he why is he in this hospital? What is he qualified? Okay. He's an MD PhD pediatric cardiologist with his PhD training at UC San Diego in vascular inflammation. He is among the most qualified individuals in the world for managing um, COVID and commenting on cardiomyocarditis in children. And they've kicked him out of the hospital. Just for prescribing? For early treatment. Okay. He also happens to be a pastor at a local congregation. He runs a food bank. His whole life he has traveled to emerging economies to provide free treatment. This is the kind of exemplar person that you know we all sh- we all should be in a, in the best of all possible worlds. And did they give an excuse for this? Are they saying that his prescription of early treatment promotes vaccine hesitancy? Like, is there anything? He's he's prescribing um, uh, ineffective drugs and put, putting people's lives at risk. But here's the point. I'm not even there. Yet. Okay, we're just winding up on this one. So the other day, right before Christmas, three days before Christmas, I get a package from my licensing agency, which I'm licensed through the state of Maryland. So the state of Maryland Medical Board sends me a package, um, and it is a complaint that's been filed against me. I have six days to respond. Basically, I end up having to respond to Christmas Day. Okay, or to this attack, claiming that I should lose my medical license. And the citations are that I didn't actually invent mRNA vaccines. Um, the, a copy of the Atlantic Monthly attack article on me um, claims that I'm licensed in Virginia, which I'm not. Claims that I didn't graduate from Harvard Medical School, which I did. Okay, so I have to respond to all this stuff. Now, I'm going through it, and, and it's just false, 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 false. All coming, and, and pulled a bunch of stuff off of Twitter and LinkedIn and sent it in and saying, well, this is the reason why this guy should lose his license, okay? Because he is responsible for millions of deaths. He said it straight out, okay? I'm responsible for millions of deaths um, because of what I've said on social media. Now, who is it that's filing this? It turns out it's the director of recruitment and external affairs of this hospital in Maui. This guy felt that it was necessary to, to send this little package of happiness right before Christmas to my licensing board to try to get my license taken away. That, what we're seeing across the United States and across the world, is it's the hospitals and the hospitalists that are attacking outside physicians. Do you have any knowledge as to why they're doing this, other than speculation? Um, if I was to follow the money, I'm going to put it that way, okay? Again, I can't yeah. get into their heads. I don't know what's making them do this. It's crazy. Okay, never been done before. Right. It's happening. You know, we went and, and did a presentation in Alaska, and the same thing was being done for the physicians that came out and spoke about early treatment in Alaska. And they, fortunately, the Alaska Licensing Board put out a very terse statement that they don't want to get involved in politics in this kind of uh, tit for tat, and that this is outside of uh, their role. Medical licensing boards for this kind of stuff are usually involved in making determinations about somebody's suitability because of drug abuse or sexual activity or other things which are are outside or malpractice, overt malpractice. Okay, this kind of political weaponization of medical licensing boards is new. Now, here's the uh, here's the the observation that I can make if we follow the money is that hospitals are incentivized to to treat COVID patients. The thing that ties all this little part of this story together, including the suppression through the government um, of early treatment, hospitals are incentivized financially to treat COVID patients. If COVID patients are being treated outside of the hospital and prevented from going to the hospital, such as the case in the Imperial Valley, 
um, where Brian Tyson, George Fareed have saved thousands and thousands of lives of indigenous Latinos that are coming across the border and working the fields. I mean, they're, they're breaking their backs to save the poor. Amazing story there with early treatments. Um, and I guess they're left alone because they're in the Imperial Valley and nobody cares, they're all poor. But in these urban environments, there is all these incentives for hospitals to treat COVID patients. And if people are giving treatments that are keeping those people out of hospitals, then they're not getting that revenue. So your speculation, if I just could unpack this, that doctor in Maui who was giving early treatment, you, re you think that the reason why he was targeted because he was directly costing the hospital money because people weren't going in? I'm not COVID? saying, I, I'm saying that the observation is that early treatment keeps people out of the hospital and that hospitals have financial incentives, including death incentives, financial To discourage incentives. early treatment. And the, and the other data point is these that are doing the attacking are almost universally hospital administrators and hospitalists. So these aren't physicians, these aren't... Ho by hospitalists, I mean hospital-based physicians. Okay, what does that mean then? What, why are they doing it? Because they're part of that system, of that hospital system. And it, the administrators, they would be doing that because... They're making... Well, they're making... So, again, I don't want to make accusations. Right. I'm observing facts. Right. Um, I want to bring this back to something we were talking about earlier, but we kind of moved past it. We were talking about the one in a thousand oh, statistic. Right. So, a uh, recent paper out of Hong Kong, comprehensive analysis, cardio, uh, myocarditis in boys hospitalized. Okay, that makes sense? That's, yes. That's word string. So that's the data analysis. So that's, that's saying the myocarditis was so bad after vaccination, and these are all verified post-vaccination. The myocarditis was so bad that you went to the hospital. Incidence rate is 1 in 27. Now, the, there's all kinds of hand the, Oh, myocarditis is mild. Those statements are, let's say, generally based on fact. Historic incidence of death post myocarditis is about 27%. Now the assertion is, well, this is a different kind of myocarditis, and therefore it's not going to kill these kids or young adults. Okay, but that's being said in the absence of data. It's pure speculation. Right. And why are they doing that? Because they keep saying that the the, 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 the instances of myocarditis are mild. I keep hearing that, that it's mild myocarditis and that it eventually goes away. But not citing any studies, and right. I don't think there are any long-term studies no, in children. There can't be. There can't be. <laughs> right. By definition. Right. right? right. Because, definition. because we haven't done what we have always done. People, okay, so let me say this. People ask me, Robert, you're the inventor of this tech. You're a vaccinologist. Why are you speaking out? This was the whole topic of the Atlantic Monthly or the tech or why has this person become a vaccine skeptic? The, 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 the Did they talk to you? Extensively. And the, three days before this thing came out, the journalist, who's, it's a fascinating, he's a young man, he previously publishes basically on woke issues in the Chronicle of Higher Education. This is his first big article. He was clearly hired. And they explicitly say the article was funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, the Zuckerberg Chan Initiative. Okay, Robert Wood Johnson is made the major shareholder of J&J, &J, and Zuckerberg Chan, of course, is Facebook. Okay, so Facebook and Zuckerberg Chan have funded this attack article by this guy that normally writes about wokeness in the Journal of Higher Education. Um, and he was totally obsessed over this question. Robert, why are you saying these things? You must have some financial incentive. There must be some reason why you're doing this. Did and you I meet with this man in person? No, just over the phone. Okay? And I told him repeatedly, because it's the right thing to do. I get this, you know, this consternation. But see, the thing is, I think I'm maybe the only one that has been involved deeply in the development of this tech that doesn't have a financial stake in it. Um, so for me, the reason is because what's happening is not right. It's destroying my profession. 
It's destroying the practice of medicine worldwide. It's destroying public health in medicine. I am a vaccinologist. I spent 30 years developing vaccine, a stupid amount of education, learning how to do it and what the rules are. And for me, I'm personally offended by watching my discipline get destroyed for no good reason at all, except apparently financial incentives and, and I don't know, political ass cover. Now, uh, back to this number, because we keep going past it, going off on tangents. Yeah. Well, uh, the, the number that keeps getting cited is one in a thousand people have adverse events, including my um, if myocarditis that requires hospitalization is one in 2,700. In boys. In boys. But, but there's also issues of people that have something like fatigue that has lasted well, those, those post are the vaccination. Ones. But I mean, there's a lot of those. Like, but, uh, there's a huge number of dysmenorrhea and metametrorrhagia. What, what are those? This is alterations in menses in women. So oh right, that is, that's a huge issue. There's and, and they deny it. Men, what menses, menses, um, women going to menopause very young. Like I know a girl who's 36 who got the vaccine hasn't had her period in eight months. And then there is the women who are postmenopausal that suddenly start bleeding. Yeah. So here's the thing about this job that kind of ties this together. Um, I'm I'm in the business. It's basically part of what I do is like a detective figuring out, because I'm trained in pathology, why is this happening? What are the things that connect these things? Okay. So what is it that drives menstruation? The answer is the ovary. The ovary is the control okay, through, through hormones and ovulation. Okay. What did we learn early on from the Pfizer data package, which by the way, when that was disclosed by Byron Bright from Japan, sent to me, was the first thing really lit me up and let me know that something here was wrong. Okay? And when I got that, I picked out, as Byram had done, I was given the task of independently evaluating it. And then I took that package and I gave it to a more senior regulatory professional that I respect. And I said, mm, these are the things I see. This looks really bad. He looked at it and he said, oh, you missed this thing, that, and the other thing. Okay? Um, these, in, these missing things include reproductive toxicology, um, uh, uh, evaluations of teratogenicity, birth defects, standard stuff that's always done. Genotoxicity, not done. What was done was a cobbled together group of data that didn't even involve the vaccine. It didn't used other mRNAs in non-GLP, that's fancy talk for not done with rigor studies, not done according to the rules. Um, all cobbled together and sent in to the regulatory agencies of the world to justify going ahead and giving jabs to everybody under emergency use authorization. That's the truth of it. That's the short version. One of the studies they did do was administer these lipid RNA complexes to rooms and showed the distribution of the synthetic lipid That's the facts that package the Possibly chargeable. It goes to the over at a very high rate. And this wasn't supposed to happen. It was supposed to 
close monitor it because there is strict um, guidance about cleanliness and intercourse. And they had a major problem because they, these, these, you know, these are all 60 plus, up to 80, long beards, gray hair, that had exquisite understanding about the menstrual cycle in all the women in their congregations. And they all knew that these menstrual cycles were being disrupted all the time. And for them, this was a major crisis because it meant that if you're, if you're in the Hasidic community, increasing the size of the population of Hasidic Jews is kind of important. It's essentially important to them. And this was a major threat to reproductive health in their communities. Now, they, they took all this testimony, they thought about it, and they came out with a clear statement that children should not be vaccinated. This this has the power of law. This should not be vaccinated in adults. It's strongly discouraged, and part of the reason is because of these alterations in reproduction. Um, and again, the point: what's the common variable? It's the ovary. This is why I say in the really statement that's going over the world, this little format clip that's kind of gone viral, triggered governments to attack, like Israel. Spain and Italy um, uh, in, a, in the same systematic pattern of you know, um, uh, trying to demean me, delegitimize me. But um, that's why I say in that, that that think twice about giving these jabs to your kids. Among other things, your the girls are born with all the eggs they will ever have. And these lipids are going to the ovaries and they appear Menstruation is just one of these adverse events. We picked out some of the other ones, the fatigue, brain fog, all kinds of things. And, and to be fair, people get that from COVID as well, correct? True. Absolutely true. And that's another fascinating area, is we have COVID, we have mRNA genetic vaccines, and we have DNA virus administered genetic vaccines. That's the J&J here in the United States, and no virus. Okay. And they all have these symptoms of clotting, brain fog, and other things. Okay? And so as you know, this is basically does it walk like a duck, quack like a duck. What is the common variable between those three very different systems, natural viral infection, mRNA genetic vaccines, and DNA genetic vaccines? Now, we don't see these problems, by the way. Adenoviral vector vaccines have been in development for my entire life, 30 years. They're licensed adenoviral vector vaccines. They don't have these problems, okay? So it's something that's not intrinsic to the platform. What is it? The common variable is spike. Just to cut to the chase. Spike protein. Yeah. And so the spike protein is probably causing all these problems with people who have caught COVID and also people who are getting the vaccine. But then the lipo, what is it, lipo nano particles? That's fine. That's a good term. How do you say it? I, I call them lipoplexus. Um, lipid nanoparticles is another term. Lipid nano nanoparticles. So, so these are the ones that are affecting the ovaries. No, it's the, it's the lipid part of it in particular goes to the ovaries, not the RNA. And that, that aspect of it is not affecting men, but with men you have a higher instance of myocarditis? And why is that? Good question. What is driving the myocarditis? So there's a couple, there are a variety of hypotheses about this. What we do know is that both the virus and these vaccines are associated with, here's another fancy medical term, microcoagulation or micro microcoagulopathy. The latter one being um, a disease of microcoagulation, small blood clots, okay? Um, there are multiple ways in which that can happen. It's clear that spike is associated with a variety of, of mechanisms that, cause, that trigger coagulation, including an autoimmune one, okay? So there's something about this, this protein spike is, whether it's in the vaccine or not, it binds to the surface of key cells through a key regulatory protein called ACE2. ACE2 is involved in controlling blood pressure, vessel, blood vessel tone, all kinds of stuff. If you activate ACE2 
on the little, tiny smooth muscle cells that wrap around your capillaries, that control your vascular tone. That's, that's your blood pressure locally, okay? Ability of blood to go through those tubes. Okay, that's controlled basically, you've got these little muscles, cells, cellular muscles, um, that control the contraction. It's kind of like peristalsis, if you know what that is, the, the kind of process that can move uh, something down a tube, like in our gut, um, you know, where we move food and waste material through our gut and eventually excrete it. That's peristalsis, the thing that brings it down through our esophagus. Same thing happens with your blood vessels. And when ACE2 fires off, it gets activated, it causes contraction of pericytes and blocks these micro vessels. And if you get stagnant blood in blood vessels, it clots like that. That's what it does. Okay? It's a normal homeostatic mechanism. So there's that. There's the whole cast. So there's, there's the effects on the local tissue. And there is direct effects triggering coagulation through a number of pathways. Now, what can cause myocarditis, pericarditis? A number of things. Autoimmune processes, which we also know are involved in some of the coagulation problems. And this kind of process of clamping down on blood vessels, um, which we know is happening. And the autoimmune response, is this also in response to the spike protein? What is, what is causing the autoimmune response? It's observed that it is happening, and it's happening with these um, uh, RNA vaccines. Um, it's happening with the adenoviral vector vaccines. I don't know, I don't recall literature that it's happening with the virus itself, but it may very well be. I know uh, quite a few people that have had viral outbreaks post, uh, like things like shingles, uh, herpes okay. outbreaks. Now that's another one. Okay, so now you're opening the, the compartment. Before we were talking about cardiac and blood vessels. Yes. And we talked a little bit about the brain. We didn't talk about the strokes. We talked about the brain fog. And it's known that Spike will open the, the blood-brain barrier is this kind of concept, it's a little loose, but it has to do with the structure of the cells that line the blood vessels in your brain and what it allows to go through and doesn't go through. Spike causes that to become more like an open sieve. So things can go into your brain that shouldn't go into your brain. So that can trigger brain inflammation and that is one of the, that is the risk that people like Luke Montanay are concerned about with neurofibrillary tangles which, and that's why they talk about prions or Alzheimer's-like symptoms. That's part of what happens when the brain gets inflammation because it's got stuff going on in there that it's not supposed to have. So, hence the brain fog. The brain fog could be due to microvascular blockade. It could be due to this clamping of blood vessels that I was talking about. It could be due to leaky blood vessels. That's the blood-brain barrier breaching. Hard to say. Multifactorial. All we know is that it's happening. And that's also something that's happening to people with COVID as well. Correct. I've experienced it myself. Okay, when I have. When I was in the um, and not only brain fog. Um, uh, you can uh, remember uh, a, a broadcaster who knew. Um, when he had COVID, he was talking about seeing hallucinations. Um, that is that is a common consequence of primary COVID infection. Is not just brain fog, but overt hallucinations. Now, after the vaccines started to be administered, it was a couple of months later, I believe, that the Salk Institute published their paper on spike proteins. Right, and I cited that in the Brett Dark. Brett Weinstein Dark Horse podcast and um, was immediately attacked by Reuters uh, for uh, spreading disinformation because I was speaking that the spike protein was a toxin. And there's actually, that's one of many papers that have come out since then or before. And I didn't say the spike protein on the vaccine. I said the spike protein. And Reuters basically took my words, twisted them, and then attacked me about it. Is the spike?